Welcome to a very special edition of New Day Cleveland. I'm David Moss in Ohio City, and as you can see, right across the street from the West Side Market in front of a building called the United Bank Building. This was built in 1925, the pride of the West Side of Cleveland, the biggest, most beautiful building. 1929 hits, it's the Depression, and everything starts to spiral down. In fact, so far down, this building also almost became food for the wrecking ball. Did I say food? Well, let's bring Daniel, a chef into the picture, life. Steve Schmoller. I'll finish this. Now, he's got Crop Bistro over on West 6th Street, right? But he's thinking about something bigger, grander, more beautiful, and maybe even do more research and development. That's why he thought he could turn this into something special. Big dream, maybe a few big problems too. This is a great story. It's the making of Crop. We've been waiting almost a year trying to get this whole deal together and uh, we finally have the green light and uh, I've been waiting almost a year to take a sledgehammer to get the first whack at the construction and I can't wait so today's the day I, the second I hit this wall the clock starts ticking we got 120 days to get open and ready August 1st this is uh, a big day Crop starts right now, uh, the clock starts ticking. We put this hole in the wall and we start building out. So uh, we got uh, a little over 90 days to get this done and that's going to be high drama stuff. So what better way to start with a little high drama? Uh, I get to throw the first uh, sledgehammer into the wall and then uh, we'll have a little celebration with spraying some champagne. Scott, why don't you come on in here? All right, get ready. I started as a kid watching, you know, one of the three black and white channels we got was PBS and a guy by the name of Graham Kerr, uh, he had a show called The Galloping Gourmet. And he was having fun, he was drinking wine on the set and he was doing all this great stuff. But if I liked what I saw, I would write down the recipe on an index card uh, and it would be over at 3.30 and my mother would go um, down to the store, pick up the stuff and then, then I would make it. Smoky black beans and gremolata. I fell in love with food um, and, and not just because I like food and eating but there was always a very social and emotional connection to um, food around the table. It was the epicenter of our house. I almost didn't uh, continue on. I was um, really thought I was going to go to uh, veterinary school. When it really, really uh, hit me is I was working in a restaurant uh, called the Barefoot Peddler on Long Island, and um, I was basically just a prep cook. There, I was making, you know, chopping onions, doing all these things. Well, it was a freezing cold, rainy night, and um, the the chef. At nine o'clock, we were dead. He goes, well, listen, I'm taking off. Uh, if anything comes in at all, you'll be able to figure it out. About half an hour later, a bus of 50 people showed up from the theater and they came to the Barefoot Peddler. And all of a sudden, I have this ticket board filled with lobster tails and burgers and chicken tetrazzini and all these, you know, things. And, and I did it myself. Um, and I felt like I had just won, you know, a football game uh, single-handedly, and that's when I was hooked. It's intuitive, I think. Uh, you know, you talk to a lot of the, the best chefs. Well, they didn't go to culinary school. Um, it's uh, it's intuition. It's the right palate. Um, it's anticipating flavor, which comes through experimentation and. Um, I learned pretty quickly. I threw myself into it uh, at age 23. I ended up opening my first restaurant. By the time I was 26, I had four places going. I had uh, uh, two restaurants, a bakery, commissary, and a catering company. My next phase after, that was 10 years in Long Island uh, with those four businesses going, I discovered a process or created a process of, of uh, adding liquids into butter uh, to make flavored butters and I was immediately started selling these things wholesale. 
I started really kind of manufacturing stuff my own through the commissary and, and um, I saw an opportunity to really leverage uh, you know, good culinary skills and intuition with the discipline of manufacturing. Decided to, let's open another restaurant. Uh, and I did, and it was a 200-year-old grist mill in Waterbury, Vermont. It was a mile away from the test kitchen and lab. And uh, we referred to it as our customized restaurant operation platform, which interestingly, that acronym is now the name of this restaurant called Crop. So uh, you had Crop Bistro downtown in the warehouse district for four years. Uh, this opportunity was kind of dropped in my lap, and the minute I looked at it, I said, I've got to do it. It's a historic 1924 uh, bank built at the height of the Roaring Twenties, and it's got marble, it's got brass, it's got bronze, it's just spectacular. I mean, the ceiling alone would cost $2 million to make. So uh, I made the decision to move over. This is my end game. This is going to be the, uh, the, the, the crowning jewel. I'm not doing anything else after this. Put it in the glass, that one, perfect. As a chef, I, I look at um, my responsibility. Uh, first and foremost is to feed people food that is gonna actually keep them alive uh, because we have to eat. Secondly is make that enjoyable uh, and um, make it an experience that can be celebrated and appreciate. Appreciate that gorgeous little wild white strawberry. Uh, appreciate that warm tomato that you pick off the vine at 90 degrees on a summer day. Appreciate the fish that was caught. Uh, and appreciate the food because it really is a precious um, gift that we have on this earth. It's such a powerful medium of uh, connection uh, between people. I don't even look at it as a business. Um, uh, truthfully, if it was about money, I, I probably uh, um, should have never gone in the restaurant business because you work yourself to death. Uh, you have to watch every half of a cent to, to be successful. But my reward is creating experiences that, that, that they remember, uh, hopefully, elevate their awareness to a different level so they appreciate uh, the fact that they've got this food to eat. It's such a great way for people to be together. As the upper floors, uh, the nine floors, were lined with marble in the hallways and in the bathrooms. Yeah, the minute I saw the marble in that room down here, I immediately knew that I was going to put it on the bars, the kitchen, chef's table, all everywhere, because it's vintage and it's original to the building. All right, it's been 21 days since we started uh, breaking the walls down, and I got 67 days left till uh, we opened the new crop. Uh, it's been a real uh, experience uh, as we've been digging into this building. I mean, it's 87 years old. Every time we'd open up something to look at how we do it, it opened up a can of worms like a domino effect. We got a problem with the hood. Well, it's not, it's not as bad as it sounds. Uh, we can't bring your wall all the way over to here. We have two hangers coming down. If you look in that pocket there, you uh -huh. have two hangers down. One hanger's carrying this, the weight of this beam over here. Luckily, the beams are separated. The other hanger is carrying the weight of this beam that we wanted to remove. But, but we can cut this whole chunk out yes. like we're supposed like to? like we said, you're gonna lose three inches uh, on each side. But three inches like on that line. I only had 48 inches to start, so that's that's three on each side? Three on each side, so six, six inches. So uh, down to 42 inches? Yes. Uh, uh, well, all right. Better than 40. All right, all right, we're gonna have to deal with that. Okay. We'll fi just figure it out. Okay, <laughs> All right. we'll make it work. Uh, on this end of the restaurant, we've got this new partition wall that's going to kind of delineate where the marketplace is. So this whole section here is going to be retail market. There's going to be a coffee kind of bakery station down there. There's going to be a butcher shop and deli, produce with tomatoes and corn. That whole wall right there is going to be our wine wall. Just envision all the colored glass bottles up there with the light coming through. Hey, Bob, give that a break for a second. We found this marble underneath this that was covering your floor up. We found this nice marble area 
Oh, cool. We're giving it a little buff right now to see how it comes back to live. It'll come back to life for us. Right here is going to be the end of your bar, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, right here in the corner. So this will be a nice little seating area. We're going to float this with the infill. You got that color chart? Wait, um, wait, 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 wait. So you're going to put another layer of fill or cement material on yes, here? Yes, yeah, it's a cement So we'll be level across the whole thing. Yes, and then you'll be, right, out, right. be bordered by all this marble. And we're going to go with this uh, forest green uh, dye on there. So it'll bring out the marble. This one, okay, forest. Well, actually, that kind of matches the, the real marble. Yep, that's what we're saying. It'll bring that color out, too. That would look actually killer. Okay, we'll make it look nice and pretty for you. Over there, what I wanted to do was to kind of give a separate space, so I did a raised platform. And uh, it's going to look like it's been here forever, because this is where, actually, the teller booths used to sit. So this platform is going to have a really cool kind of oak rail around it, envision all these tables up here this is going to be like the vip section everyone's going to want to be sitting up on that table in front of these windows so everyone can be looking through one of the challenges in building a restaurant is actually getting your exhaust system and your hood well there's nine floors above me and if i had to run ductwork nine floors i probably wouldn't have done this project however whoever designed this had the foresight to put a single floor right here so my whole kitchen area, I'm able to just put my ductwork up four feet and be on the roof. But this is my dream kitchen. Uh, this is all wide open to the people. There's gorgeous stainless steel hoods on both sides. I'll be standing right here grilling, sauteing, foie gras or fish out into the general public as they're watching us. The first month, we've gotten through all kind of the big mechanical stuff, the raw build out. Now we're ready to really start having fun bringing this whole place to life. We're down in the basement uh, outside of the vault. Um, this, this entire thing just blows me away how they built this. Uh, I think this, this vault, they had to build this and then built the building around it in 1924, but I found that this door is actually 90,000 pounds of steel. One of the key things that was in here is as the upper floors, uh, the nine floors, were lined with marble in the hallways and in the bathrooms. So there's hundreds and hundreds of feet of marble that we've taken out of the building all over the place and kind of created a boneyard of marble, which uh, I knew that we were going to use. I wanted to repurpose as much as I could because it's all historic. And, uh, you know, the preservation of the building is one thing, but being able to really use stuff uh, that was here 87 years ago and put it to good use is an amazing thing. Plus, the price is really right. We're going to bring all this marble back to life by hand picking the right pieces that match up where we need it on our counters. Then we're going to take it down where it's going to get polished and trimmed and then sized uh, and then, then the edges cleaned up. So when we put these onto these marble, uh, onto these countertops, it should look like it's been there for 87 years. So Dominic, my marble guy, hey. Yes. Alright, um, we need to make the selections. Um, we know between the two bar surfaces, we have a total of 70 linear feet, plus the returns on that. So I've kind of gone through this, but I need your opinion on like on some of these pieces that you are convinced we can use them in those linear runs of the bar tops. So I kind of culled out a bunch of these things, but like these are seven foot by 36 inches. Now I know like that one's in a good shape. You want to take that? I want to take definitely this one. Uh huh. This one we've already marked. You know, this one's got some holes in it uh, from old mounting screws. We right. can use that. We can repair those and, and make it almost even kind of look even cooler. I think. Sure. With well, repairs, <clears throat> um, if we have to. Let's hold on to this one. We may be able to find something better. What I wanted to do, and they agreed to it, which is great, is they set up their their cutting and grinding and polishing in the basement. So we could take each piece we selected that was going to work right and then be able to bring it here, do the work, and then bring it right upstairs. Instead of having to lug tons and tons of stone out of the building, now we can do it all here. 
So uh, here's a piece that we picked for the main bar, uh, which is seven foot by uh, seven foot long by three feet wide. Our countertops are 27 inches. So he has to cut this now to be exact size. And we, I think we need five of these exact ones to match up. So first thing is uh, Dominic's gonna have, a, you got the water gun going. They're gonna cut this almost like it's a piece of plywood. Stage two is uh, 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 polishing the tile with a wet so it doesn't, it's not too abrasive. Boy, that's looking, what I see already is coming up looks great. All right, guys, this looks ridiculously good. A little more. I was hoping you'd say that. Yeah, I'm blown Perfect. away. Perfect. I mean, they're, they're back to life and like magical back to life. Look at that. The one, and we got a nice vein running down the middle one. It almost matches up to it, yeah. Well, I mean, for, as, considering these were all randomly pulled out of the building, uh, they're gonna look spectacular. I mean, absolutely spectacular. And we're gonna epoxy the seams with a resin epoxy. Right. Tint it, um, just off-white in this case. So and these uh, are already, we've already taken the edges off. These are already beveled down. Not all these of them. We'll do on the so we'll, we'll, we'll do these once they're up, then kind of tune them yeah, up. Yeah, we're gonna tune it up once we get it all installed. To see this, on the bar top uh, in its full glory is, uh, I'm not that an emotional guy, but uh, this really gives me goosebumps. Uh, to have this come back to life after 87 years is, uh, is really a testimony to, uh, to its value uh, and history. To be able to just be able to sit on this and rest your arms and watch and eat a great meal is uh, it's, it's what I'm doing this for. You know, I was in here by myself for one day with a 30-foot tape measure. I saw the design, I drew it to scale, met with Gary, and it was just great to work with someone who had the passion for what I was doing, saw my vision, and then we connected those dots. Um, we were approached by Steve and the owners of the project approximately a year and a half ago to begin the process of designing the new crop restaurant at the United Bank building. Walking into that building, we looked at you know, what great architecture there was already in existence in the building and we had to look at it from the standpoint of how do you uh, build upon that or react to that rather than try and overpower it or put something that doesn't match the interior of the building. Because of the large lobby space, uh, the banking lobby, the main banking lobby, 34 foot ceilings, huge space, is just absolutely cavernous. So it's wonderful for seating a lot of people. The problem is creating a sense of intimacy in there is difficult because of the large volume of space that you have. So our goal in the project was to create the intimacy that Steve had in the other crop space and to try and bring people into his show, if you will. Things that we had to be very careful of in the building were things like the mural, the ceilings, the walls. So all of those impact building systems that we have to put into here to serve a restaurant rather than to serve what was a large bank lobby, which had a few desks and some lights and some bankers sitting around at it. So we have to bring a light level in we have to also do that sensitively, and the lighting that was in the building was absolutely just gymnasium lighting. In suspending any kind of lighting, we had to look at the vaulted ceilings and not negatively impact the castings that are up there. So if you look at the ceilings of the space, they're just very dramatic. The mural itself provided a challenge in that there was a border on the bottom of the mural. Well, we have some partition walls which separate off 
the uh, bar area and the, we'll call it the market area at the east end. Those walls could not be higher than the bottom of the mural. Likewise, the back bar could not impact that mural, so it could only be as high as the bottom of the mural. Fitting a kitchen into what were small offices was truly a challenge because we have to get in uh, large uh, exhaust ducts for the hood systems, work in all the kitchen equipment that he needs on the first floor, and then also be able to conceal sort of the back of house kitchen equipment, which a lot of that went down to the prep kitchen in the basement. So, no, it's Sitting down with Steve, uh, Steve's, uh, he came in there with some preconceived ideas. They were very good ideas. Our job was to work with him to bring those ideas to reality and work within that code. Really, anytime in design, it's very difficult for a lot of architects to react to things because of egos. So we all have our own ideas and we feel strongly about them, and so does Steve, and so do most clients. You have to be willing to compromise some of what you do and, and work with them rather than against them. So some of the things that we looked at originally, and I could show you, uh, for instance, the raised platform area which is this little area. Well, it started out, if I can find it now, it started out with the idea that we were creating a bank teller wall with the little teller windows and a little rail across there so that folks would sit up there at, at what would be a raised level. That obviously has changed in the space. So you'll see now that this is an open railing and it gives a better view and it lets people be seen as well as see down below. Anytime you see a bubble on an architect's plan, it means it's something that has changed. We started out with three very tall trees in planters in the middle of the space. And that was going to be the option of providing some lighting and giving us sort of an outdoor piazza effect. Those were actually eliminated because the space is just so great. We really didn't want to bring anything overhead. The glass wall over here, when we got into the space originally, that had been built out in drywall. And when OHPO saw that in some of the photographs, they said, no, can't happen. That was not originally there. That has to be a translucent wall because the original entrance to the bank was off of 25th. Creating spaces that people like and that people use, that's the benefit of this job. So I guess we get to do, you know, our, our art is creating spaces that people can use. Well, basically, um, we have a building that is one of Cleveland's uh, historic gems, and um, there was an incredible amount of faux finish work that was original to the building. Um, through the years, fell into a state of disrepair, so we had the challenge of bringing those finishes back to life, um, recreating the original marble work, the stone work, doing a lot of color matching, and of course, we have this amazing coffered uh, ceiling that we're finishing as well. I actually uh, visited the building about two years ago when uh, MRN had acquired the property and I uh, just couldn't wait to get in here. Um, so I mean slowly you know we're working our way from top to bottom and uh, making those finishes just shine again. It's a little bit of heaven, you know I really enjoy, um, heights have never been an issue, um, but it's really neat just to be able to go up and you know be a part of something that someone handmade. I mean they. Uh, created these all by hand, the molds. I can't even believe the technology that um, you know, we have now compared to what they had then. So I think uh, being able to make it something that people can enjoy again and resort to its beauty has been um, a, you know, an honor, an absolute honor. Knowing that this was a building that at one point was such a public epicenter, being you know, one of the largest banks it, in this part of the country and to know that it was vacant for a while I and mean, what Steve is now doing and opening it up and people are going to come in and be able to just enjoy the splendor and to be a part of something that's bigger than um, you know just you know a framed canvas and this is something that you know really means something to the city it means something to Steve it means something to the patrons and um, it's, a, it's an absolute honor to be a part of it. Right now we are custom color mixing um, to do a spot treatment. About uh, 40 to 50 percent of the ceiling um, was completely stripped. So we had to use a multi-layer process to rematch inch by inch um, the ceiling. The thing about the ceiling too is every area is so different 
I mean, just you can't get one color and just paint it because you'll see it. You're working, you're moving, you're readjusting to lighting, and you know, trying to um, just handle uh, some of the the chipping and you know to get that under control. And I mean, there's just so many different elements that you having to take into consideration, and you know, getting down, looking at it from um, below, and just readjusting all the time. It was a challenge, but it's definitely worth it. I mean, you look now, and it's it's just it glows. So basically what we're doing is coming back in, color mixing, so that we could refo um, the marble pattern on the large columns. So what we did um, was basically created a layered effect where you get your base down and then you go into the details of the veining process to recreate that look of the original marble um, inherently beautiful to the building. Well, I think it's unmistakably unique. It's one, it's something that you couldn't create now. I think um, knowing that you could come in here and look at the ceiling and it's something that is so timeless and um, so uh, one of a kind, I mean, it's just priceless. You good? Yes. All right, hand me your tools. There's so few buildings left like this in the country. Uh, I have a deep passion for history and this building just was screaming to be brought back to life. There you are, sir. Thank you very You're much. Very I told you guys this job is fun. Welcome back to our very special edition of New Day Cleveland, and we're talking about the making of crop. That's right, a brand new restaurant. What a great event for Cleveland. And for, of course, Chef Steve Schmoller. You know, it's all about bringing this building back. You know, they say they don't make them like they used to, and maybe that's one great reason to, uh, to save the place. You know, the architecture, the detail, the fine materials. But when you really think about it, maybe Steve saved something even more important. I think he saved some history. The United Bank building was built in Cleveland by a local firm named Walker and Weeks in 1924. They're kind of the hometown boys. Um, they are one of the more well-known architects within the city of Cleveland. They were responsible for a lot of the public buildings in Cleveland. The fact that a substantial amount of their work still exists uh, they were Beaux-Arts trained architects. Their buildings are very high style, as you can see by the main dining room. Um, those things are still here and they're still relevant today. This is actually the second United Banking building that was built on this site. The first one had been destroyed by fire. Um, this was a reconstruction of that in 1924. And then in 1929, the stock market crashed and the building was shuttered after that. Because this building is a National Register property, it means that Washington has some control over what you can or cannot do um, to the building. So we have to be very careful in showing the, uh, showcasing the original pieces of the building without compromising the historic character and also putting an entirely different use into the structure. So you'll notice the elements that were added to the building really don't match the style of architecture of the building and that's done very purposefully. We have to show that that was not part of the original structure. If you're a Cleveland architect file, I guess, uh, one of the things that you should take a look at is certainly look at the ceilings um, and notice the acoustics of the space upstairs. And while it's a very lively room, and there's a lot of conversation and mostly hard surface up there, you can actually have a conversation at the tables without feeling like you're hearing another conversation or being, uh, having to shout to your neighbor across the table. Uh, the mural's kind of interesting. Um, when the mural was cleaned, the clouds appeared in the background and um, it's one thing that uh, Stephen mentioned and, and we've talked about a number of times that you know, we kind of surmise in 1924 this building was built. You know, were those the clouds gathering on the horizon for the economic downturn with the stock market crash in 1929 that actually caused the demise of the United Banking Company on this site? By all means, come and look at the bank vault in the basement. Not only look at the two big doors, which 
are still in place. One was on the banking side, the other was on the public side in the very ornate lobby that you would come into to see the bank. Um, Walker and Weeks, the architects for the building, are noted in little builder's plates on those bank vault doors. Uh, but the fact that the bank vault itself is the largest bank vault between New York and Chicago other than the Federal Reserve Bank in downtown, which incidentally Walker and Weeks designed. Anytime a, a client comes to us and says, I have this vision for this great old space, and it's someone like Steve that says, we're gonna put a restaurant into this space. You know, for one, it's a very interesting challenge for us. Um, and, and you know what, it's a lot of fun. It's, it was, it's fun to come here and, and have lunch and dinner and see people experience the space in a different way. I mean, I get paid to draw pictures for a living, so you know, watching those things change and become real is always uh, a really exciting part of the process for us. When we're able to see a building like this repurposed instead of paved over and a, a new shopping center put in there, or a parking lot, which is the worst thing of all, um, to have this building get a new life and to get, get a different life and show that it can actually work as something else really not only opens up the door for just this building, but it opens up the door for a lot of other people who may have that old building that they just can't quite figure out what to do with. To start from the ground up and reconstruct this space would be millions and millions of dollars and there is just no way that that could have happened to support simply the restaurant function. You know, doing this project in Ohio City, uh, right across from the West Side Market, and you know, the, seeing the mural in there with the, the entire market theme is just a really great thing. Uh, the cooperation of the folks in the, you know, in the neighborhood, um, you know, from the Design Review Board to the people at the Building Department in the City of Cleveland, they were all very good to work with. They knew the challenges that were in this building, not that there weren't you know, bumps in the road, but they really helped to smooth out those bumps and made the project go relatively smoothly. Um, it means more to this neighborhood now because there's traffic here, it's generating taxes for the city, so it's a good positive thing. There's just no negative aspect to what is going on here. Crop is an internationally known restaurant uh, with great chefs and such a great ambiance. And to have it right here across the street from the West Side Market just speaks volumes. You know, Steve has perfected so much of the awesome farm to table cooking, organic cooking, fresh food cooking. And so to be within sight of the West Side Market, which really is, you know, the capital of Cleveland, uh, is a huge thing. I always joke with people and I say that if Cleveland were Rome, the West Side Market would be Vatican City, so I guess that makes Steve the Pope. We feel about this building being repurposed like, almost like when you get a second chance at, at something. Um, before Steve came in, before Crop, before Ari Marin started redeveloping it, the building was about 80% uh, vacant. It was horrible, right? One of the most beautiful structures on the west side, let alone the city, across the street from Vatican City, the market, and having it empty when you know the potential that's here. There's just a life and an energy here, and you had this spot in the middle of it that was dark, and Steve came in and he just turned the lights on, and we couldn't be more thrilled. The challenges for a project like this are what you could imagine. Um, you have a structure that was a bank building. You have um, the whole aspect of parking, right? You know, there's not a lot of land around here. You've got, you know, a very active corner across the street. Then you've got a park that's being rebuilt across the street. So really, Steve had to kind of come in here and do everything, get a business up and running, all the while everything else wasn't stopping. One day I was in here with a group of bankers. and. Um, we were, the, the place, you know, looks nothing like it does today, but it was beginning to take shape. And Steve had this scaffolding up, and the thing literally went from the ground to the ceiling. And he took us over to where the scaffolding was, and on the very top of this four-story scaffolding inside the bank building is this little teeny artist. She's on her back, and she's painting the ceiling with a brush. 
And I thought to myself, if that's the kind of attention that this place is getting, it's just gonna be amazing. Having crop here is a signal to other restaurateurs that life is good in Ohio City. It's just the kind of excitement and energy that Cleveland is, is very proud to have, but it's something that I wish we could replicate because having his vision and his leadership in this community has been extraordinary. We're going to have different looks and feels. You know, Looking back on this whole project and the hundreds style. and hundreds of decisions to be made, you, you know, you, you, you're second guessing sometimes, but at the end of the day, it just came together so well. Everything needs to be ordered today. Right. Uh, we got 30 days, give or take, till this has yep. to be on the table. So, yep. this is the Wedgwood? Yes, Steve. We're going for more of a brush satin finish on a lot of the metalware that we're presenting, including yep. the flatware. The pattern is called Satin Fulcrum. Satin reflects the, uh, the brush look. Now, the, the now this steak knife oh, yes. is, uh, my only concern is this is gonna end up in purses on the way out the door, but... Uh, Extra security, Steve. Yeah, well, we may need that, but um, I want this steak knife, all right? Good choice. Now, my plates, this is my canvas. This is what everything happens on. Um, now, this was what we called, what the, this is the Botticelli, correct? Botticelli, what we're looking at today is all um, bright white porcelain, twice fired, incredibly strong from Oneida. Now, this Botticelli pattern is one of the most award-winning designs in the world for commercial China, designed by Queensberry Hunt in England. It's actually ergonomically developed on the Oh, on yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. So you, you know, the wait staff can actually and the dish, hold, and hold the dishwashers. <laughs> they can hold it without slipping and, exactly. and dropping a plate. Now, there has been a ton of uh, effort put into the wine program and the glass selection. Now, I know uh, Scott uh, and Jackie did a fair amount, uh, and I think we've landed on the Spiegel out. We've done our homework Absolutely. for you. The Spiegel out line. Mm -hmm. on the wine program, it's a done deal. It's a great choice. Spiegel is actually um, made by Riedel Crystal. Um, we, saw, we say this is more of the commercial application. It's got unbelievable flexibility to it. Uh, with my food, I've got so many diverse kind of uh, areas in the appetizer, the salads, the entrees, and the plateware is the canvas. And, you know, I'm really, really particular about, you know, how much real estate that is, you know, on the plate, that it's not cluttered, it's not over, you know, piled up. And, um, you know, in this space, we was really a challenge of, you know, we didn't want to be too contemporary, you had to kind of have some uh, honor the history of the room. So every little detail, the silverware, the, 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 the china, the glassware, when you sit down at the table, uh, it should feel like you're, you're sitting down at something special that, that you can tell people paid attention to. I'm dying, I want to get this in here. We're installing the hood system for the kitchen, and uh, the hoods in, in all restaurants is a really critical thing. Because number one, they have to work really well, otherwise the place gets filled with smoke and it's hot. Uh, and it's also, in many cases, the most significant chunk of a budget, which in my case it is. And fortunately, we're only going up one story. We're in a nine-story building. If we had to go up nine stories, I probably wouldn't be standing here because it would have been prohibitive to actually spend the money. You gotta go six foot six. And these hoods are really special, actually. We're the first ones uh, in the country to install these new, they're called Echo Arch hoods. They're designed um, to be 70% more efficient uh, than a normal hood, and they also have um, UVC, they're ultraviolet light cores that take all of the grease particles and, and turn them into dust. About 15 years ago at my, at my restaurant in Vermont, I, I had this stainless steel background. I wanted to do more to it, so I came up with this process where I use this really high-speed buffer with sandpaper and I design into it what looks like patterns and flames. So it reflects the light 
uh, really well, almost kind of holographically. So when we're cooking and the flames are shooting up, it reflects off of these really cool textured stainless steel. She's in place. Can I fire up the grill yet? Absolutely, I'm hungry. Yeah? Let's go. How do you like your steak? Oh, Medium, baby. <laughs> Medium. Uh, look at it. This is a monumental day for me because um, these are special hoods. They're designed specifically for what we're doing. And um, now that they're hung, it means we're a lot closer to opening up. I uh, had a pretty aggressive timeline to try to get this whole project done. Uh, we ended up going exactly 30 days over. Uh, and in the scheme of things, that's not bad considering the magnitude of it. It was a pretty big undertaking. But I'm really proud of how it, how it came together. We ended up really coming down to um, a 30 days off schedule. I really thought we'd be Labor Day. Uh, we're a month later than that. So it's not going edge to edge. It will. It will go edge to edge. You realize what you missed or you overcompensated for. They were supposed to be really simple, so that's why they said they could do them on time. This is pretty much all we're doing tonight for desserts, right? We have lemon bars as well. We make all of our special um, infused uh, liquors. This is an apple vodka, watershed apple. This has been a long road. This is 30 years of vision coming together for me, 30 years of working my butt off. Uh, and I can't tell you how excited I am to stand here right now knowing that we're going to have 500 people show up to help celebrate opening the new crop. The kitchen is just feels so good. Um, I already know the way it's kind of set up in the flow. I've been mentally preparing dishes, you know. Then the bar and the chef's table with the way that the marble that we polished that we got from the building that, the way that whole look came together, it looks like it's been here for 87 years, and it looks like it was supposed to be here that long. We now have added a marketplace. We have a retail element where all of our ingredients, if it's on the menu, it's in the marketplace. Uh, and I think our marketplace is gonna be really, really successful. But then the culinary center with the test kitchen, the laboratory, and then throw in the bank vault that happens to sit 120 people, that we can do private parties for. There's so many components to this that, that I've been working on for now 30 years, all comes to life under one roof. And um, that's, to me, is what makes it so special. Well, I hope you enjoyed this trip to crop as much as I have. A great story of saving a historic building, or maybe it's a story about a man's dream come true. But I know one thing, Clevelanders go out and travel, and they see things in Chicago or New York, and they say, like, why can't we do that in Cleveland? Well, now we've got something in Cleveland where folks can come here and say, why can't we do that in New York or Chicago? It is a wonderful place, a great story, and I hear a great menu. So jump in the car, come down, check it out, enjoy the story we just told you and have a great dinner. I'll see you on the next New Day in Cleveland.